I couldn't focus on the foresight in all these orange russet gold. Large, big male, winter. And I was standing on the ground. He was, he was dead meat. He was 30 yards away. But I just couldn't do it. I couldn't press that trigger. One day, a royal hunter from the Vankanil family of Gujarat couldn't pull the trigger. This marked the birth of an era of wildlife conservation in India. He not only gave up hunting, but devoted his life to the protection of wildlife. He went on to join the civil services and demarcated 14 new sanctuaries and eight national parks. He also drafted the seminal Wildlife Protection Act of India. Ranglas's team gets in conversation with the author, conservationist and role model, Dr. M. K. Ranjit Singh. I grew up in an atmosphere which had um, wildlife right around the house. It was an era of hunting and an era of transition. And therefore, my grandfather and my parents uh, insisted that I should work and uh, that the, <clears throat> my Jagir revenue, uh, which I was getting, would not be enough and that I must um, do something on my own and uh, not just make a living but try and make a mark. My parents did not take me to Kana. I had heard so much about it. It was then a game reserve, the Banjar game reserve, but Kana. And um, um, <clears throat> I was left sleeping in the morning, early morning, on the 1st of January, I remember. And when I woke up, they'd all gone. So I cried and cried on the banks of the Narbada, and I said, I'll become the collector of Manla. I will <clears throat> uh, not take my parents to Kana when I become the collector of Manla. They did come when I became the collector. So that was one posting I asked for. And uh, I think my wife and I are agreed that this is the most rewarding and most enjoyable period of my entire career, the three years in Mandla. At that time, Kana was confined to Mandla district only, but the ecosystem spread more into Balagat than in Kana. And uh, there was much more wildlife possibility and prospects there, including the Parasinka. I wanted the park to be extended. We had already moved in the matter. The DFO on, on the other side, in Baragat, had given a report saying there are nine tigers here, which is wrong. There were many more than nine. And that uh, the revenue from this area on an annual basis averages 45 lakhs. So each tiger will cost the state government five lakhs in perpetuity. And when Mr. Malhotra, my secretary, saw this file, he said, he looked up and said, Ranjit, how can I do that? You know the state of the finances of the state. And uh, how can I write off 45 lakhs per year? Uh, in those days, uh, <clears throat> my salary was about 1,500 rupees per month. So a rupee went far in 45 lakhs, a lot of money. So I argued with him. Then, when I ran out of steam, as I said, I said, sir, please do it for my sake. He looked up, smiled, and signed. And Karna got the greatest extension of all. There are two kinds of hunters. One are what I would call gunners, to whom the animal is a target. And then the other brand of uh, hunter, was those who wanted to possess that animal because he not only admired it, but he loved it. You love it so much that you want to kill it to possess it. But, you know, it was such a driving force for protection. Uh, and as I've said in my book, uh, those princes who hunted had more, and the family hunted and the guests hunted, had more wildlife to show than those princes who did not hunt at all. Because the motive to preserve was just not there. Three royal families and their guests in 35 years in three neighboring districts of Madhya Pradesh shot 3,500 tigers at least. And yet after the, that Holocaust, uh, there were more tigers then 
more forests certainly, and more tigers, more wildlife, than today after Project Tiger. I don't defend this at all. I'm just showing the fact. When I came to the government of India, forest and wildlife was then a minuscule part of the Ministry of Agriculture, because it was then a state subject. It was Mrs. Gandhi who, during the emergency, changed the constitution and made it a concurrent subject. And then this meeting was called uh, by Mrs. Gandhi, uh, just to advise her what, to, what should be done about forest and wildlife. I came there and I sat there, and all these people, and she kept on asking, so, and Dr. Karan Singh and the IG Forest said, we are doing what we can, but it's a state subject, we can't do very much more, this, that, the other. And then I was asked to speak, because I'd kept quiet. I said, Madam, the situation is not so bad, uh, not so hopeless. I think we can do something about it. And uh, so she said, what? I said, I had two things to begin with. Firstly, our uh, laws are archaic. The forest, wildlife laws is just a part of the Indian Forest Act of 1927, which allows hunting. It talks about which animal could be shot, when, what size, what numbers of hunting blocks. And uh, there is nothing about national parks and sanctuaries. There is nothing about creation of protected areas. Nothing about trade, control of trade and taxidermy. We do not have a legislation. And Dr. Karan Singh, I remember, said, which state will give us this power? And Mrs. Gandhi chipped in and said, I will write to the chief ministers. And she did. 18 states, including one non-Congress rule state, passed a resolution in their assembly before I had even completed the drafting of it. That was the difference. Now, which state would pass it? <laughs> so, I lived luckily in a little more amenable times from my point of view. And a week later, within a week, a note arrived on the table of my minister, Mr. Fakhruddin Alayman, that Ranjit Singh should be put in charge of the wildlife of India. The project a Tiger was a first of its kind. And we selected first nine areas of Project Tiger, not on the basis of the number of tigers alone, but of diverse habitats that the tiger occupied and the endangered species that lived in them. Tiger numbers, of course, was a consideration. But there were far more tigers in Kaziranga than they were in Manas. But we selected Manas. Kaziranga was already well protected thanks to the rhinoceros. But Manas had at that time the largest number of uh, endangered species, 28, under the Wildlife Protection Act. And it was in, in many ways, a much grander place, and it had a greater ecological diversity. The interesting thing was, at that time, the majority of the uh, tiger population was outside, tiger, outside these areas. Mm -hmm. But gradually, the number of tiger in these tiger reserves increased. Elsewhere, they were wiped out, which shows that they have a, 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 a future, a long-term future for survival, only in effectively managed national parks and sanctuaries. That was what I could foresee way back in the 60s and 70s. So I made it a life ambition or a goal of mine to have as many protected areas as possible because nature <laughs> uh, will survive only in those places, including forests. People go to a national park not to have communion with nature, not to experience the biodiversity in the various species, but what I call to ogle at a tiger. Or might as well go and see it in the, in, the, um, in the zoo or safari park. Why do you go to and waste all this money? You know, there is a black market going on. I know of a family who's paid 40,000 rupees for one trip because they wanted to see a tiger. And when they were seeing the tiger is doing nothing, he's just lighting, and there are 40, 50 cars lined up there and talking away, taking selfies, and uh, just disturbing the whole thing. But what is worse is this. What if one tiger outside of the Cowbert National Park dies? 
it makes it to the front page of Times of India, and rightly so. Why not? It must. But if <laughs> a species, the hog deer, goes extinct in Corbett, and there are less than 15 probably now left, does anybody care? Does anybody know? Will it ever be mentioned? Where is the fault? Yes, in um, 73, the crocodile situation in India was there. Uh, numbers were very, very low, particularly of the gharial, uh, which is totally harmless and it's a fish-eating animal and it's unique amongst the crocodile world. And it's uh, now confined to only India because it's gone extinct in, in the Indus. So the FAO, Food and Agriculture Organization, they approached us in the Ministry of Agriculture for this uh, uh, project and that they would finance it. Uh, and support it. Uh, the Gadiyal uh, was uh, then believed to be, according to Ram Vitaka, who is an expert, about 60 breeding pairs left in India and the world. So we started this breeding program. In the case of uh, UP, the first eggs were stolen from Nepal because none were available in our shores, in our area. I remember receiving a phone call from Bustard saying they are none available, but I can get them from across the border. So I said, uh, do that and you can pay for it. But please don't get caught because if you get caught and there is a diplomatic bruha, I will disown it in the sense that I, I cannot now say I ordered it. But yeah, but don't get caught, but get them. And he did. And they bred. And the great thing about crocodiles is, unlike other carnivores, they don't have to be taught how to, uh, the mother doesn't have to teach the young uh, how, to, how to catch fish. It's instinctively. So those who have survived in dead fish, up to three years, you can put them into the water and uh, they'll start catching live fish as if it was something they've always known. And the other very interesting thing about crocodiles is that you can have what you want by way of the gender. At 28 degrees incubation, they're both males and females. At 29, they are females. At 30, it is all males. At 31, you'll get freaks. At 33, they're all dead. To my mind, it is the most successful project that we have undertaken anywhere in Asia. I don't think the government, in my candid opinion, is doing enough. There are certain things where you do not cross the Rubicon, the Lakshman Rekha. There are certain things which must be sacrosanct. And if you are not prepared, as I often say, to dig for diamonds, uh, if they were found under the Taj Mahal, and if you're not prepared to blast for oil in Ajanta and Alora, or mine for coal, should not the same kind of sanctity be given to Kaziranga and, and, and Kana and the others?